cloud. Thank you very much for that reminder. Okay, so I want to share a screen. Okay, and when we, for those of us in our Torah literacy, we may if the word we talk about bris and finding the bris in the Torah, you may remember that there's such a thing as a bris with Abraham. Abraham was the first one who was told to, to have a bris. And he was told to circumcise his household and his children afterwards, descendants afterwards. So that's uh, uh, hundreds of years before what we're reading about in the Torah portion yesterday. And it occurs, we're already into the you know, middle of the third book of the Torah. And Abraham is more towards the beginning of the first book of the Torah. So we have the idea of a bris earlier on. And I brought that down. It's chapter 17 in Genesis. It says, I will establish my covenant between me and you. This is my covenant that every male among you be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your, of your foreskin. We, I think we all know what that means functionally. Now, what does it mean spiritually? What's a, 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 a covenant? Covenant is that a, a um, if you think about it in life, if someone's really special, your spouse, obviously it's for the child, or even a, a really a, a close friend. And we say, we have a lot between us. There's something very strong between us. We want commit, to commit to, to each other that even in, in times that aren't um, necessarily guiding us towards closeness, maybe there's a, a distance in, in place, maybe something comes up that disrupts us. We should always remember that we have something very special between us that is, is incorruptible. And we have to rise above our differences and, and recognize that our relationship is, is deeper than any ripple we can, we can, accomplish, we, we can, uh, we can encounter, if you really believe that. So the idea of a covenant is that there's a relationship which is above relationships. And there are people I, I, I see, there are people I, I work with, there are people I, I interact with, a neighbor, we're nice, we're friendly, we're, we're acquaintances or we're friends. And then if something happens, maybe we're not friends. I didn't realize you didn't like me or, or after what you did to me, we're not friends. I mean, this we can go through life and we can reassess our relationships. Then there are some relationships we say, I, I can't believe that this happened with that person. But instead of cutting and running, I'm gonna say, I, I, we gotta sit down and talk about this. This is too valuable for me to, to discard because, because something came up. I gotta understand it more. I gotta, I gotta see, oh, I wanna dig and, and see if I can find the relationship that I know we once had, or I think we once had. So one of the things that it says there in Genesis when it comes to, in, in number two, the idea of a covenant, God tells Abraham, he takes animals and they are, they're dead and he's, he, he splits them in half. Sounds a little gory today, but he splits them in half and he places each part opposite its mate. So he has, so half an animal here, half an animal there. Okay, so let's say, let's say it's a goat, whatever. And then it says he walks between the two animals and there's this fire that goes with and representing God. And the idea is just like an animal is one integral unit. There's two, the two of them in between, they are also like encompassed by two halves of one whole because they are also part of a greater whole. So the, the imagery in the Torah, um, I'm just gonna stop this for a minute. The imagery in the Torah there is that a covenant represents idea that there's a, an inherent oneness between us and God. On the face of it, we may find closeness to God at one point in our lives, maybe not find closeness to what, you know, it's, 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 it's like what maybe in our consciousness, it could be like any value that we have. And we'll, we do agree, we don't agree. What the Torah is saying is that there's an inherent 
oneness between us. And just like, let's say, between a, a parent and child, and a child can say, I'm not, you know, after what, what you know, what uh, my, my father wrote uh, or, or whatever it is, we did something, I don't feel close to him. There's, there's, there's a distance. It unfortunately happens often. The position of Torah and my position in talking to someone who's going through that is that, you know, obviously the hurt is real. It has to be addressed. But you can't really divorce a parent or divorce a child. So you know, what you want to do is be able to, to, to um, work and, and then fight to be able to, to recognize the inherent beauty of the relationship. Mm. But that's, that's not going to break apart because there of a squabble we had, even if it's a serious squabble. So that's what a covenant means. Now, so we all have a covenant with God, every one of us. One of the things that the, the Talmud tells us, um, and actually, so one sec, before we get there, I'm sorry. The, what, we, what we read yesterday, number three is, on the eighth day, the flesh of his forced skin shall be circumcised. Now, this is actually the mitzvah, just a, a little, it's kind of a factoid, a little bit separate than the, 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 the uh, more psycho-spiritual um, uh, road we want to uh, travel today. Just for those keeping a note at home, the actual mitzvah, when we, we have 613 mitzvahs. There is no mitzvah really for us to do, to circumcise our children just because Abraham did it or Sarah did it. We don't, the Torah doesn't tell us we have to do everything our, 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 our ancestors did. So the idea of God telling Abraham and even telling Abraham that he wants his descendants to do it, it's not a, it's not a, a mitzvah to us. It's, there's nothing binding to us. It's, it, it, God told it to an individual. Something becomes binding to us when it's presented to us at Sinai as a mitzvah for us. So the narrative and the events of how the, the practice of circumcision, circumcision entered the Jewish people is explained. And, and related to us when it talks about Abraham and, and then his son Yitzhak and actually Yishmael also was circumcised but it doesn't become a binding mitzvah for us until Le in Leviticus now it, it, the Jews are in the desert they're actually still near Mount Sinai and, they, and God gives them this mitzvah as part of, of, the, of giving the Torah now it's binding on us for generations and again we say it's binding on us and the idea, it's, it represents the, the covenant. Now, the Talmud tells us, and because I think there, there, there's an obvious question, so if it's, if it's something binding on all of us, so why is it only a, a, a circumcision of a male? So the Talmud uses the language, a woman is considered as one who's naturally circumcised. It may mean biologically there's nothing to, to cut, but the, main, the, real, the idea is that that um, spiritually speaking, whatever impact that we want to be, to be able to, to um, and, and we're going to talk a bit about this a little bit, of uh, bringing to mind and bringing to our experience the, uh, the, uh, the idea of a covenant, because it's a very profound idea that we're so connected to God that there's no, no, there's no separation, there's no way of us separating. Within a male, the, the process of circumcising, the physical circumcision is important. It's a mitzvah. It's, it's considered a very uh, critical thi um, thing. When it, um, now with the, uh, Pesach, you know, in the Torah, it says that the person who wasn't circumcised couldn't partake of the, of the, uh, of the Paschal offering, which it, 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 talking about in, in Egypt, it was a big deal, circumcision. As, as, even though we won't, don't want to weigh and measure mitzvahs, it was a very big deal as part of, as, as part of our, our, our national consciousness and our national identity. But we say, so why, why is it that on males, it's, it's all of us? So the Talmud says is that the, 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 the sense of consciousness, of connectedness, is, more, is, is something that is naturally within the, the female psyche, whether the females feel it or not, it's not there. And for the males, there is this action that we take to be able to, to trigger it. So that's what I want to talk a little bit about today, or more than a little bit. This idea of 
trigger what what does the bris accomplish what are, what's the the idea spiritually in our consciousness the idea of of it's yes you're cutting off skin but spiritually what's happening so let's look a little bit here so in in note five this is uh, um, this is from the Rebbe, and something he said in 1953. If you trace it back, Gennady, certainly there is a core of this in the Zohar, but I was tr I'm trying to find language which is, which is a little bit more um, appreciable uh, to some extent for our, for our understanding. The Rebbe's language was like this: There is a small spark of God, the Creator, enclosed within a small spark, core spark of our souls. So this is really very dense language, but the idea is that we all have a core of our souls. We have souls. So you and I are speaking. We're relating. We're relating, let's say, my intellect to your intellect. But the, my, the, in, in, in theological language, it's, I am using the intellectual dimension of my, of my soul and relating to using my, my, my uh, soul power of, of communication to be able to, to build a bridge with you so you can absorb it through your soul power of absorption and, and comprehension and we can, we can share an idea. We have different elements of soul. The Medrash tells us different elements of soul. The Zohar tells us different elements of soul. The core of the soul is, is known as Yechida. I think this may have come up in a, in a, in a prior class. I don't remember because recently I did speak with someone about something. It could be with a women's class. Yechida means oneness. It's yichid is actually feminine for oneness. Yachid would be masculine for oneness. So what the Rebbe is quoting is from, from the Kabbalah is that there is within our yichida, within the core of our souls, where we are one with God, there is a, an element that is, that is nestled, nested in it in the core of our souls, and that's yachit, the divine oneness. That's where the, the most intimate relationship between us and God, the, our, our inner spark together with a divine spark, that becomes our consciousness. And that oneness, which is yachida, the oneness with God, that's our core, and that's an, a oneness which can, it's just indestructible. This internal oneness with God exists within each and every one of us, regardless of how it may seem to us on a conscious level. The godly spark stems from the essence of the divine as distinct from the godliness found in angels. So I, I brought in that last part because it, you know, I, a lot of things I just put into dot, dot, dot. But one of the things that I was writing there is, is a, a, a fundamental Torah perspective, which is that our human connection with God is more profound than anything else in the universe because we are given moral choice we are given the capacity for virtuous acts, and they're virtuous because we can choose to do otherwise. And we are, in that sense, we are we have the capacity to mirror our Creator. We can achieve incredible things as far as holiness and connectedness. We can, God forbid, also achieve the the opposite. We could be, you know, a, a leper in the jungle really can't be morally faulted for killing, for food, whatever. That's 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 its nature. Not a murderer. It's a, it's a leper. It does what it does. And maybe if, if it's uh, captured and domesticated, maybe you can change its nature. But it it does what it does. A human being, when it, it chooses to do good things, say someone you know has chosen to 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 spend these pa past two years of COVID brightening people's lives. It's it's incredible. It's beautiful. It's it didn't have to do. And that's a person who's, who's emulating the creator. That's one end of the scale. On the other end of the scale, someone who chooses to you know, in, invade a, a neighbor and, 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 uh, and, and hurt and maim and, and, and kill is not a leopard. As much, a leopard's not immoral. A leopard's not evil. For a human to choose it, that's evil. That's even that's it's it's it, it, it can, you can't get lower. So the idea of angels, we say angels are spiritual. They are inherently spiritual. They're much more spiritual than me and you right now because they can feel and, and sense 
the the the, the the purpose of all reality and and feel the godliness and everything and i'm just looking at a computer and an angel would understand the godliness in the computer but an angel is is frozen in its place the angel doesn't do mitzvahs no matter what you know hollywood says there's no such thing angels are are angels are actually called in, even in our prayers and in, in, in the scripture the holy animals why because animals they're they, they have their, their nature Animals can't, uh, no animal says, you know, something, I feel like peeing in the corner, and no one taught me not to be in the corner, but I have a feeling, you know, my, they, 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 these people, they, they've been feeding me, and they, it would make them upset. The animal has no, no capacity for self-assessment. You can, you can train a, a dog or a cat what to do, and it'll, it'll follow, you know, Pavlovian style, other way to do it, because I, I, I don't know enough about that, but the, you don't, the, it, there isn't a, a, a moral consciousness can be naturally they're, they're wonderful warm loving beings or not but it's not it's not a, a a moral decision type of idea human beings do and and um and angels are, are like animals in that sense they are who they are so they're called holy animals in the sense that they are they are static we are not we choose moment to moment and we we and of how we're going to be that reflects as the river brings, that reflects on our core godliness, because just as God has free choice, we have free choice. Okay, so the the when we talk about the soul, its core is this, this godly being, and then God assigns it to a a, a, a body to be. Jane and Joe. Have uh, now have fertilized an egg. Jane is carrying it. Now there's going to be a fetus, and God assigns this holy soul, because they all are holy, to to the the, the fetus. Uh, Talmud says in number six, what is a fetus experience in its mother's womb? It rests with its hands on its two, two sides of its head. I think there's obviously some of this is uh, metaphoric. A candle is lit above its head, and it gazes from one end of the world to the other. The Talmud never meant that there's a candle inside a, a, a mother's body, but the idea is that it, that there's something. It's a, I mean, there's this metaphor here is that there's there's a flame above the fetus. I mean, in other words, there's something from above. The fetus is not understanding, but it's that the, the the fetus has spiritual clarity because it has it it's in, in a, a transition between the a more divine intensely purely holy godly experience and transitioning into the human experience in which we don't uh, don't instinctively see the godliness around us but while it's still in in the mother's womb it has this clarity then it's as with gest gestation the body integrates more and more the the soul integrates more more and more into the body and the, it becomes more uh, possible for the the, uh, the idea of the, the it's taking hold in the human condition, and then um, I didn't bring all these things in, but then it becomes a full fledged human when it crowns in, at birth, and then this Kabbalist uh, in number seven, so there'll be soul on the Kavi writes, and this is uh, this is an accepted thing found in Jewish law too. From the moment of circumcision, the baby soul becomes integrated into the physical body. The, the, there is a, there's this transition from divine being into human being. And the, one, one of the very critical um, watershed moments of the, the, the um, manifestation of the soul, which is so core, that's oneness with God, it's with with bris, even though the baby doesn't have a consciousness, the baby's not thinking. I mean, I'm sure the baby's thinking, but the baby, the baby's not understanding anything. We're acting on the baby. But that's it's this the, the bris is helping to anchor this deep holiness, this deep connection with God through the bris. Then just to go a little further. Okay. 
And then in Jewish law, it says, and I, I quote it here from the, the founder of Chabad's uh, code of Jewish law, but it's not just not just in his. It says the complete integration of the soul into the body happens at Bar and Bas Mitzvah, and the beginning of the integration happens with induction into practice of Torah Mitzvah, including the bris. So what what the Jewish law is saying is that part of what makes the bris um, a, a, an important trigger for manifestation of the soul is the fact that it's a, a mitzvah. Um, with a girl, we talk about the, the, by the with the baby naming at the Torah. Also, that's a very a, a critical part of the manifestation of the soul into the into the physical body. And then bar and bas mitzvah. Now, bar and bas mitzvah, what you have is fl a flowering of moral consciousness. But I just said before is that one of the the, the main uh, definitions of what makes a, us human, what makes us so special, what gives us the capacity to be godlike and God forbid the opposite. Is the fact that we have moral choice? You know, I, I said my daughter, my, my daughter just had a baby. That baby is not making choices for quite a while, and I mean any moral choices. And even as the baby gets older and 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 has understanding, we don't see a child as being having the in, the capacity, the, the inner tools for self discipline and for moral understanding. Until the Bar and Bas Mitzvah. That's what Bar and Bas Mitzvah are about. Bar and Bas Mitzvah are about the, the, the achieving the idea of a conscience and therefore being able to, to say, and I, I tell us to every Bar and Bas Mitzvah kid, it's being, being, being in a position to say, I, I really want to do that. My friends are doing that. It looks like it's going to be fun, but mom and dad or my teachers told me it's not good and I will choose not to do it. It's a lot to expect from a 10-year-old or 11-year-old. Actually, it's a lot to expect from anyone. But at 12 for a girl and 13 for a boy, we say, now you have the tools to do it. That's what we're expecting to, you to do. That's really the whole bomb bus mitzvah. Eric, you were asking something. Or did I make a mistake? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, there are two questions that arise about circumcision in Exodus. Okay. I'm going to take the later one first. Okay. And the one that I... The later one that I'm referring to is as Moses was returning to Egypt, his wife came along behind with, with their sons and was, you know, circumcised the boys. Yeah. And, you know, basically the comment after that is this is a covenant of blood. Now that raises the question of is circumcision merely an incision or is it a complete circumcision? The other question I have is considering the nature of Pharaoh's decree, Moses was put into that little ark very quickly and Pharaoh's daughter commented that this is a child of the Hebrews. Uh -huh. uh, now, was he circumcised at that point or was he circumcised privately shall we say later on so um two very good questions um i all i would say is that from the the narrative um one thing that we can take that's relevant to us from the narrative of what happened when moses what had happened just to keep everyone up, up to speed with this moses uh, we'll start with from that. The Jews are, are slaves in Egypt. Um, and, and Pharaoh makes a, a, a decree that all baby boys should be murdered, thrown to the Nile. Moses is born. And I, I, we're, we're told that, um, and the Torah says very clearly, that, that his mother and his sister put him into a, a little boat you know, to be safe floating in the Nile and because uh, they, were, they were keeping tabs of pregnant women until someone, they felt they were in the clear. Um, and Pharaoh's daughter goes to bathe in the Nile and take, sees this little boat and, and it's the baby and says, this is a, a child of the Hebrews. How does she know it's a child of the Hebrews? Conceivably, because she saw um, it, it was circumcised, even it, but even though we're, as we're going to say soon, a lot of the Jews were not circumcised in Egypt. They didn't, they, after over the hundreds of years of, of persecution, that's something that, that fell away. But 
but she saw him circumcised. Now, the, the Talmud says he was born naturally circumcised. So, but she definitely saw a phenomenon of a, a baby without a foreskin. That, I mean, that definitely, that's what the inference is. Now, as far as um, uh, later on with, um, with Zipporah, when Moses runs away, he has to run out of Egypt because he kills an Egyptian tax, taskmaster. And um, when, when, he, when God, uh, after God tells, uh, speaks to him from a burning bush and he, 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 he's on his way back to Egypt now to speak to his uh, really uh, an adoptive grandfather, um, the Pharaoh, to say, let may people go. They um, had one of their children, he and his wife Tsipora, and it, the Torah in a very cryptic way doesn't does not flesh out the story. Um, it says that uh, that um, Moses was was in danger, and she took the she took a, a rock, a sharp rock, a flint, and she she cut off his foreskin, which is, it's not just an incision; it's it's, it's taking off the skin and and. It's apparently it's it's the louder skin and there's a, a, a thinner membrane, um, and and then and it's called a covenant of blood, as, as Eric pointed out. Um, the blood part I want to get into a little bit later, but from here also, I mean, there's there's a lot of, of question about what this is. Why, if if he had to be a circumcised, why didn't Moses circumcise him earlier? Um, and I think a point was that uh, they were traveling and it was not, they, they were afraid of the baby having to travel um, with, uh, at the circumcision. And therefore they wanted to wait until they got settled in Egypt to circumcise him. And that was especially given the weakness of the Jewish people and not being careful about circumcision. That was something that uh, it, it, the, the, the danger he faced, the illness, or whatever, however, because it doesn't say clearly in the Torah, but he, clearly he, was, he faced the problem was because they were delaying the circumcision and his wife had the vision to see that's what it was. And she, she immediately cut off the foreskin that solved the issue. So now let, let's move a little further to number nine. What, what is the bris? Actually, before I go into it, Briz has, we know, it's, it's cutting off the foreskin. It's cutting off, as I said, there's another me membrane there. It's a physical thing, but it's it's representing the uh, fundamental oneness with God. It's un un unbreakable. What's what's it teaching us? What are we, where, what are we learning from it? So Maimonides, in his Guide for the Perplexed, which he wrote for people who, who didn't totally, you know, Drink the Kool-Aid of, of Torah thinking, and and he, he it's designed for people to be able to, to uh, uh, explain Torah in a way that's a, a more what he considered to be more rationally palatable for people who are not uh, just uh, accepting everything on faith. He said that the idea of a bris is it's it's focusing on an area of the body, which which. Um, can represent at times the, the a intense drive for self gratification, and therefore self gratification could be with chocolate, self gratification could be at an opera, self gratification could be sexual. But he says the the intensity of the sexual self gratification is something that is is really representative of all our drives for self gratification. And the idea of taking off, removing the foreskin is idea of that in Torah life. And in order to be able to, to truly connect with God or truly connect with, with any loved one, we need to take the selfish layer, external layer, selfish external layer off our, our drive for self-gratification because that makes everything about me about, about the, the individual. And we want to try and enjoy life, but have more of a we experience between us and our loved ones, between us and God. So Maimonides focuses on that. So let's go here. It says, 
The bris removing the foreskin symbolizes a, a tempering of the self centered lust for sensual pleasure. I didn't put in the exact, for some reason, I, I forgot to do that, to put in the uh, exact footnote. If you want it, I'll give it to you. Um, it, but it's tempering the self centered lust for sensual pleasure. Now, the Rebbe unpacks this and he says, in so it's like this. There are three components if you break it down. And he says this is legally and then spiritual. Legally, in a way, there are three components that miss are missed. Number one is someone has to actually do something. You have to perform a circumcision. Number two is that means the product is that a person is circumcised. Now, and then number C is that, that the person's foreskin is not there. Foreskin has been removed. Now they all, it all sounds like one big thing, but there's actually halachic um, distinctions of why uh, all these three, for example, and that everybody brings them because this is something found in Jewish law. What happens if someone is born circumcised? Like I said before about Moses. Being so born circumcised would mean, well, right now, this, this, this baby, if you look at him, he, he looks circumcised, right? Number like like Pharaoh's daughter did. There's no no problem with the foreskin, but nobody did anything. Nobody did anything, and that's missing. So if today, in Morristown Hospital, a baby is born without a foreskin, and they call me up and say, Rabbi, I, I want to have a bris, but I just want the bagels unlocked. So we don't have to cut off the foreskin because everything's okay. Would say that actually, by Jewish law, there would be a pinprick to draw a little blood and make a blessing and, and, and a, a, because you have to do something. Or say if one reverses the circumcision as that ever brings another example. I've, I've never heard of it done today, but in the times of, of, uh, of the Hellenist occupation of Israel, there's, there's a, 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 quite a, good num a good amount of discussion about what was going on at the time. But there was a lot of, um, the naked body was considered um, it was you know, an object of beauty, and there was a lot of competing naked, and therefore people's circumcision was was in display more than it is in our society now. And Jews who were Hellenized, they were embarrassed by the fact that they were circumcised. So they, they would go through painful surgeries to stretch uh, skin to cover up the, the circumcision. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, in the Hebrew language, uh, the Talmudic language is like pulling uh, pulling one's skin to cover. Now, if he did that, so the person had a bris. So he took care of, of number A. But the thing is that, um, and the, right now, they're not without a foreskin. The, the, actually, the foreskin is gone, but they're, they're covered. So just because they did it is not enough. And, and and because right now they're not they're not I mean they don't have a foreskin but they have a they they're they don't have a, a an open the penis is not open it's not a circumcised when you look at it, it's not a circumcised penis so therefore that that person would have would not be have even you say listen I filled that mitzvah a while ago no because part of it is that they need to be consistently circumcised and the third one is if one is born with two foreskins. So even though we'd say that uh, you you, um, you know and you had a bris on one of them, so you say, well, you, you had a bris and you did it. But the fact is, if they still have a foreskin, they would still have to 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 take that off. So the 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 point that that I was making that's a legalistic thing, but he's trying to say that there's three different elements, psycho spiritual elements that go into the bris, and he continues on on eleven circumcising represents the idea that we need to act to better our lives if we're if we are naturally in a good place if we're naturally kind and generous that's great but that's what god that that could be naturally if that's our our instinct that's not where our work of life exists we need to act to circumcise now how what do we do what we want to do is recognize that we have an inherently good self, the soul. And therefore, and we just spoke about it, it's, it's intensely divine. 
the divinity lives deep within us. We we start to anchor it, you know, with with the bris and bar and mitzvah. But the truth is, of course, as we all know, people can go through their entire lives not tapping into this this inner sense of connectedness. So the job is to reveal it. We reveal our higher selves. And not how do, one of the ways we do this is by taking off our foreskin. Not having our foreskin means not allowing our personalities to be overtaken by our self-indulgent passions. That there's, there's a, a, an idea of not letting what we think we want out of life to get in the way of our moral compass. Many, many years ago, I remember sitting in the old house next to good, two good friends. Um, uh, they, they came to, to show for Shabbos, I remember, by, by Kiddush. And I was just eating my gefiltevich. But we were sitting together. And one of them says to the other, and they're both very intelligent people, good people, still very good friends, and said, so, so what do you think about all this? I said, what do you mean? He said, if all this is true, we'd have to really uh, rearrange our lives. And the other friend says, yeah, I know. And then they continue, continue eating like a filter fish. I, it, it's, it, it's, I can understand someone saying, listen, it makes a lot of sense to me, but I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not doing a, a 180 on life. Of course. I, and then it's probably not healthy. But the idea is that we want to be able to distinguish and say, this is who I want to be. There is a connection with God. I am a Jew. The things I want to do. It's di- this is difficult for me. Hey, God understands that, but not to avoid, divert our eyes from the goal because I can't handle the question. Because what's it going to mean? We have an inherent identity. We're Jews. We have a, a connection with God. There's a, there's a program to to, to follow. It, I wasn't raised this way. I can't do it. I mean, whatever. I don't need the, 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 the responses. God needs the responses. If I can help, I can help. But it's not, it's, and God understands you, the struggles better than we do. And I'm sure God, God allows, you know, gives us, uh, gives us some, some uh, leeway in understanding. But first is to acknowledge and say, this is who I need to be. Because that is me. And uh, distracting myself and, and putting, you know, uh, trying to make my life feel meaningful without being true to who I am essentially is, is really um, taking me down detours in life. And it, it's one step at a time, it's small incremental growth, it's, only, it's between me and God where I end up. All of that is true, but to be at least clear about where I need to move. And that's where the circumcising is. The idea of circumcising is that we need to take action. We need to be conscious and, and, and reveal, so to speak, who we truly are inside, which is what Jews and where, where we are. We have, a, uh, and, and there's this oneness of the connection with God. And we have a Torah to, uh, to that, that guides us in that connection. And make sure that we're not, uh, do our best to make sure that we're not, um, sidetracking ourselves because it's just too painful to think about oh my gosh I, I, how am i gonna you know live without uh bacon and eggs you know someone who grew up in bacon and eggs i'm, I'm not being flippant about it i get it it's, it's a, change is difficult i i i my change is difficult i didn't i've never had to deal with that change but i hope i acknowledge and say that the change is necessary and if we can, you know how we get there is again between us and God. So now, having said that, I want to look at um, one area of uh, of Jewish law about bris to to try and drive this home a little more. Okay, so we said like this that um, in in number twelve, the, the the Talmud says, based on the verse that we read yesterday in Torah, it says, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And the the Talmud says, he's circumcised on the eighth day, even if it falls on Shabbat. And Shabbos, we're not allowed to do any um, unnecessary, unless they're, they're life-saving, not, necessarily they're not surgical procedures. We don't, uh, if I would not, if, if uh, I, I, I get a splinter on Shabbos, 
unless uh, I'm afraid of some uh, serious infection, I'll wait till after Shabbos to, to take it out because I don't want it, it's, I'm going to be drawing blood. We don't, we don't do it on Shabbos. And yet on a, a bris, if my, uh, my grandson had been born on Shabbos, then this coming Shabbos, we'd be making a whole celebration out of, uh, out of uh, a, a, uh, a surgical procedure, I'm cutting off the foreskin. Why do we do that? Because the, 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 Torah, the Torah says, and what we read yesterday, it has to be the eighth day. If it's the eighth day, it, it, it overrides the Shabbos. So now, what happens if it's not at the eighth day? So if we don't do it the eighth day, then okay, we do it late. Like we have, I just brought an example. We, we recite Shema in the morning, every morning. It's supposed to be in the first three hours of daylight, roughly. So, so one who recites Shema from that time onward, after three hours, although one does not fulfill the mitzvah of reciting Shema uh, at its appointed time, nevertheless considered like one who reads the Torah and is recorded or wrote it accordingly. Okay, so you did what you did. It's Torah, you can read it later. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not the mitzvah, it's a late mitzvah, but it's something. So one would say that someone who's late with a, with a bris would be the same thing. You did it later. Maimonides writes in number 14, says the first part says we should not circumcise a child who is afflicted with any sickness at all since the danger to life takes precedence over everything. So in other words, uh, my daughter's baby, if people say oh, he was born Thursday, so is the breast Thursday? I say, I don't know. It's up to the doctor. And the doctor checks the bilirubin to make sure that it's, it's safe to have a circumcision. Then we know it's going to be the eighth day. If the doctor says it's not safe the eighth day. The answer is it's not going to be on, the, on Thursday. And even if my daughter and my son-in-law say, no, it's so important because the Torah says the eighth day, say so you're not allowed to do it. Torah says you're not allowed to do it when, it, when, it's, when it's dangerous. But then, so that we understand, that's the Torah principle. But then Maimonides adds something. Even though he seems to have taken care of it, don't circumcise a child when there's a sickness because danger of life takes precedence over everything. Then he adds something else. So circumcision can be performed at a later date. Well, it's possible to bring a single Jewish back, soul back to life. He adds something on why. He's saying circumcision can be formed at a later date. What well, we, we understand that. What's he adding here? So some commentaries and, and the Rebbe um, pointed to this, saying they say that Maimonides is, 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 is giving a, a second perspective here also, saying that Although certainly we want to do, the Torah says clearly, you read it yesterday, that circumcision should be on the eighth day. If it happens later, it's not like a later mitzvah. It's as, it's as though it was done on time, which is a little weird. It's, it's, it, it, how do you retroactively do that? So they have, someone got a bris. I, I've done a, 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 someone the bris for a 40 year old. So you say now they, it actually happened at eight days old. It didn't happen at eight days old. I, I, I was in the operating room. It happened when he was 40. So he, he has the mitzvah, the bris. It's beautiful, but it's a, a late mitzvah. There's no fault of his own or everything. So the, but Maimonides is saying circumcision can be performed at a later day. So one of the things that I've pointed out here is that what this means that now if something is the idea of bris is not creating a new reality. It's not sprinkling holy water and saying now you're a Jew, now you're connected to God. It's none of that. The, the reality of connectedness to God is hardwired into the soul that's in utero and the soul that, that crowns and comes out of the, the, the mother's womb. You and I can't create it. It's there. The processes we go through are to just reveal it. So, and this is one of the processes. It's a profound process. It's a very important process. 
but it doesn't create any, any relationship. It may help us feel the relationship, but it's there. So, you know, if I'm able to, to bring some type of rabbrashman between a, a, an estranged parent and child, I didn't create any relationship. What I helped to do was dispel some schmutz that got in the way. But the, the parent-child relationship is there. It's much deeper than anything I can do. The bris relationship, covenant relationship is, in, is innate. It's essential. And therefore, what we're doing in doing a bris, even when it's late, again, it shouldn't be late. It should be on the eighth day. But for whatever reason, it came late. The, the quality and the, the, integ the essential relationship is exactly as it would have been at eight days. It's there. It's not as felt, maybe not, not as accessible, but doing it late, saying, you do it later, he, the kid's sick. The kid's not well, you can't do it now. But you're not losing on the relationship. The relationship's there. Now, the only thing is you want to try, you want to bring it into reality. So you want to bring it in as soon as possible. And the Rebbe compared that to our, our relationship we have with God in general, obviously, because it's talking about that. And one is specifically about how we repair our mistakes, because there's there's a, another idea, and I speak about this sort of every year, probably or Shani Kippur. I can't, I can't remember exactly the idea of make I made a mistake. Let's say uh, this morning I was disrespectful to someone, God forbid, and I hurt their feelings. So either I can ignore it, which would be terrible, or I can go over and say, I'm really sorry and feel it. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, which is good that I, I apologized. Better is for me to, to use that mistake as a, 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 a learning moment to be able to, to um, avoid such pitfalls in the future. So then the mistake is part of my growth and it's part of goodness going forward. And therefore we're transforming it into, into positive energy. That's the way I usually speak about it. But I want to take a little bit of a deeper angle here. First, we'll go to the idea. The Talmud says, number 15, return you backsliding children, says the verse in Jeremiah. The Jeremiah. That implies that initially when you sinned, it was only because you were backsliding, rebelling. You were you're in a foolish place. It was an act of Im immaturity and foolishness and could be ignored as if it never happened. So we're going to overlook it because it's not really you. But the uh, same Jeremiah says, is also written, I will heal your backsliding, implying that he will heal the sin from this time point forward, but that there are still sinners. Or, or, uh, so so it, the, the Talmud saying, what's the deal? Is it that the repentance and it, it totally erases as though we never made a mistake? Or is it from, uh, from the, the time of apology going forward? It says, where everything is forgiven as if they never sinned is referring to repentance out of love. That we out of love of God, out of love of a fellow, it's it's an enthusiastic that we really feel the connection. And the Talmud there it goes on to say, greatest repentance as one's intentional sins are counted as merits when one repents out of love. When one repents out of love. How is it? Why is it that our our, our sins are are uh, are now they're transformed into, into mitzvahs, transformed into merits? The sin was a sin still. It's like there's a question here. Do men think about the circumcision generally? It's a hot topic that I know I know to many now the decision is it is abuse. What are these general thoughts regarding circumcision? I don't know if men think about their circumcision generally. Um, it's a good question. I, I don't, but um, I don't know. Good question. Um, so the the idea of of the this type of repentance, the Rebbe took a, a, a deeper um, look at it. He said, when someone makes a mistake, you were disrespectful to someone. Let's, let's keep it benign. You made a mistake, you did something wrong. You were detached from, from goodness, detached from higher values, detached from human empathy, and now you're apologizing. 
But what was was you made a mistake. It was a bad time. One of the things that the founder of Chabad, Rabbi Shnazalman of Ladi, wrote in his Tanya, which is a source, uh, his fundamental book, it says, the divine soul only, always believes in the one God and remains faithful to him even while the sin is being committed. It says, even while we're doing something wrong, there's a part of us that is totally connected to God. Like, like we talked about with the British, it's one with God. I'm in the middle of doing something wrong. I, I'm never fully unplugged from God. At the time of the sin, the soul was in a state, sorry about that, soul was in a state of veritable exile in the, in the perspective which causes the body to sin and drags it down with itself to the lowest depths. The person's confused, they're swept up in passion, whatever it is, but, and they did something wrong. It's, a, it's, it's wrong, period, it's wrong. But Looking at it from God's perspective, using a spiritual microscope, they're at the time they're doing something wrong, they're actually not totally unplugged. They're confused. They're totally uh, not thinking about the oneness with God. But it, they're, not, they're, they're not unplugged. I just want to say there's another question. I've seen the question argued about that. Uh -huh. um, this is a, it, it's, there's always that, that inherent oneness. So one of the things that the, the type of point that said, if someone says, you know something, uh, yeah, this morning, I really want to, uh, I'm going to try to use the bacon and eggs. Uh, uh, help, help, I don't know if I don't, hope no one finds it offensive. I, I had bacon and eggs. I'm not, I'm a Jew. I'm not supposed to eat pork. I had bacon and eggs. And I regret it. And I'm sorry, God. And you know something? I'm going to try and, and do better. There's such a thing as uh, fake in kosher bacon. I'm going to do something. I'm going to speak to the rabbi. See if I can I can uh, satisfy my uh, my uh, uh, culinary desires in, in a kosher way. That's all beautiful. That's really beautiful. What the Rebbe is saying is what what uh, what Jewish spirituality is saying is that even at the time, what you're doing then when you sit down and say. I, I am, I regret the behavior. And now I want to reconnect with God. And I want to make sure that I don't fall back into the trap. It's not only that I'm taking that action and using it as, as a, a catalyst for positive behavior. Not only that I'm, it's all great stuff that I'm moving forward positively. At the moment I did it, there was a part of me I wasn't accessing. I was squelching. I was burying. That part of me was the part of me that loves being a Jew. The part of me that wants to be connected to God. I was totally ignoring. I was if not either consciously or subconsciously, I was burying it because I want to make my bacon and eggs. Now I am retroactively showing that part of myself. I'm activating it. I'm activating it, not just that I'm taking the, the behavior which was non-Torah, and using it as a catalyst for good. I'm bringing out that at that very time, it was a part of me that I was not allowing, but I'm, I'm redeeming that. I'm saying that I never, I never lost my connection with you. I forgot about it, but the connection was there. And now I want to live the connection. I want to live the connection that, I, I, that was going on at the time I did it. I want to bring that to life. So there are these... This idea of the connection, I just want to finish off, and this was from a, a, something we read uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I think, but I, I brought it here again because it's also relevant here. The, the, I'm talking about our connection with God. God's connection with us is the same. It says, God says that to Hosea, and we went through this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Hosea was a, was, a, 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 uh, one, a, 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 was a prophet who God taught a lesson, either practically or metaphorically, it was a debate. Because he said to Hosea, your children, Jewish people, have sinned. And Hosea should have responded, but they're your children, God. Extend your mercy over them. You don't want to divorce yourself from children. But not only did he fail to say that, but what he did say is that the entire world is yours. Since Israel sinned, exchange it for another nation. Hosea said, so what do you want from me? You're the boss. Go take it for some another, another nation. So God said, you know something? Go take a prostitute. Bear yourself for yourself children of prostitution. You want to see what it's like, Hosea? Go take a prostitute. Build a family. After that, I will say to him, send her away from before you. If he's able to send her away, I will also send away the Jews. 
And what happened is when, when he told Hosea to send the children away, Hosea said, send away my kids? God, I have children from her. I'm unable to divorce her then. Just as you, whose wife is a prostitute, and your children are from her, are children of prostitution, you don't even know if they're yours, if they're children of other men. Despite this, you are still attached to them and will not forsake them too. So too am I still attached to the Jews who are my children. There's this idea that we're always, always connected with God. Always connected with God. Now, and God is always connected with us. The question is, do we feel it? And do we act on it? And one of the things that, come, that, that comes out, and I've never spoke about this in 1953, but in, in the, his talk there, he drove home that the bris tells us not only that we're centrally connected to God, but that it's our job to circumcise. It's our job to do an action to feel it. It, it drove home, it brought to my mind that years ago, uh, someone who lives in the neighborhood asked me to speak to her brother, who was had uh, planned for conversion Easter. This was about, about maybe this time of year, a little bit before. He had a he had a, a conversion plan for Easter Sunday in in the church. Jewish boy. I, I, I don't know the guy, but then I can't uh, you know, just fix him. But of course, I agreed to meet with him. He sat here in my office. We met several times, and and I had told him. I said. The one thing is just understand that from my perspective, from a Torah perspective, no matter how many crucifixes you carry, no how much, uh, how many baptisms you go through, how much holy water is, run on, uh, is thrown on you, you're always going to be Jewish. It's who you are. So it, it, uh, my advice is check out who you are before you, you delude yourself into thinking you become someone else. You can't. It's in your spiritual DNA. So as the conversations, and I can't remember, it's uh, probably 10, 15 years ago, the conversations went on. He said, you know, if I, he told me about his Jewish trauma and how he had been treated. And I, I understood that, uh, that you know, he was looking for, for acceptance and, and love and he didn't find it in, in uh, and he did try to find it in, in, in Jewish houses of worship and Jewish community and, and found it in the church. That's where he really was looking for. Um, and he said, you know, if I would have spoken to you before all this, I wouldn't be on this track. But right now, they're planning, planning a very big party for me, Easter Sunday, the church is, and it's only a few weeks away. So, so I said, well, is, it, is it about the, you don't want to waste the money? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll come up with the money, we'll, we'll pay them back. So he said, no, you told me yourself. It, 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 I really, conversion doesn't really mean anything, so I'll go through it with them. I'll go to church, I'll go through the conversion, uh, they'll be happy, and I'll, you, you and I will know I'm, I, I never really did it. So he was using my words against me. I, I'm an ability, I understood he meant that. So the point of, of, to, to respond to that, and what the Reverend brought about this is, we, can, we do share an inherent, unbreakable, incorruptible relationship with God, and it's to be treasured but it's not to be taken passively. Our responsibility is to circumcise ourselves, which means to, be, to actively seek to reveal it, to actively seek to dispel the things that distract from it, that, that cover it, that overlay it. That's our responsibility. And just to sit back and say, listen, I can do whatever I want, because look at what Isaiah said. God, God said we're always going to be, we want to do one. Try that in a marriage. Try that in, a, in, in any uh, uh, valuable relationship. Listen, we've got such a close relationship, I don't have to worry about how I treat you. That's not right. That's, right. That's selfish. It's, and it's, it's so disrespectful to the relationship. We want to relive the richness of the relationship. We want to, 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 uh, to tap and ex excavate the beauty of the relationship. The idea of saying that no matter what I do, I can't destroy it, that's true. And it should inspire us, but it shouldn't, incentivize us to do whatever we want. We have a treasure uh, in relationship with God. We celebrate that on Pesach. We, we should celebrate it every single day of the year. And the while it should, it should give us comfort in knowing that nothing we do will ever undermine it truly between us and God, it's, uh, we need to be active. We need to be circumcising. We need to, to, every day, look and say, what can I do to more uh, 
fully appreciate the beauty of the, the gift I have. So we went over time a little bit. Is there any questions? We can entertain them. Not. So I wish you all a great, a great week. Thank you, Rabbi. Yes, be well. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.